Well, hey, um, who has an anniversary in the month of August? Anybody have an anniversary in the You do, you do, you do. Oh, there's several. Oh, oh. All right, now, we, now it's on. Okay. David Center, when, when is yours? The 10th. The 10th. Elena and Kevin? 22nd. 22nd. What are we at? The, are we at the 19th? And what, who is back here? The 13th. The 13th. So it's the 18th. I think the 22nd wins. That's the closest. So Dave and Elena, here you go. Michelle, would you take that back to them way over? They're way in the... Raise your hand. Uh, Kevin and Elena. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. You get a book. Uh, that's, a, that's our real, real marriage book. And... Um, we're in this series called Real Marriage. We'll be talking about that today. And uh, if you want a copy of that book, we actually have more copies out in the, uh, in, in, at our resource center outside. Love for you to stop by there. Um, uh, do you guys all see the new parking lot? Uh, we got it all repaved, some new spaces back there. And I just want to say thank you to you because we had this generosity campaign where we raised money for several things, that being one of them. And we got that. We got these new video cameras that help people uh, to, to watch the, the, the services. Uh, we did that. We did the parking lot. We're actually going to be doing a new uh, children's computerized check-in. We're going to be uh, upgrading our children's area and the worship area they have. And we're also going to be doing something up in the impact room. And so thank you for your generosity. I just wanted you to be aware that uh, those are how your dollars are being put to work, and, um, and I think it's helping uh, make Foothill Church a better place. Well, uh, that's all the, one of some of the great things about ministry. One of the hard things is that uh, sometimes uh, people leave. Um, you, you get something going and, and God moves on their hearts and he has better things in store for them, better things in store for the church and moves people on. And so uh, I just want to kind of have a little family conversation here about a couple of things this morning. Um, if you're new, you can just listen in. Uh, pastor Chris Wilson, our junior high pastor, a couple weeks ago uh, submitted his resignation uh, to Foothill Church because he's accepted a position at, uh, at, as youth pastor of Pasadena Christian Center, of course, in Pasadena. Uh, we love Chris and Lindsay. Chris is a man of God. Lindsay is a woman of God. She's a great worship leader. Chris is a great preacher. Uh, they love your kids. We love your kids. And, uh, and, and we hate to see them go. But on the other hand, we're very excited for where God is taking them. Uh, but he and Lindsay felt like this was their, their time and that God was moving them to this new location to kind of be more in the urban core and do some things they were uh, wanting to do. Uh, um, now I'm telling you this now because next Sunday will be Pastor Chris and Lindsay's last uh, Sunday here. And for those of you, especially those of you who have kids who have been under their ministry, love them, uh, we, we would just encourage you to either you know, write an encouraging note, maybe have your child write a note to, to Chris and Lindsay, maybe bring a gift for them uh, when you see them next week. But we're going to pray for them. We're going to send them off. Uh, we believe what God is doing in their lives, and, uh, and, and we, we, uh, we send them with our blessing. Now, for those of you you're saying, okay, but now what do we do? Uh, well, uh, let me say a couple of things real quickly. First of all, I believe uh, wholeheartedly that the Bible teaches us that God is sovereign and God never works at cross purposes with himself. I and mean, here's what I mean by that, that if this is the right thing for Chris and Lindsay, then this is the right thing for Foothill Church and God has something in store for us. And so I can say with full confidence for Chris and Lindsay, for Foothill Church, the best is yet to come. God has something in store. We, we, uh, we uh, don't have anybody yet to replace him but we've actually are in conversations with a few people. We're going to keep you posted. We just ask you to pray. Uh, we're, we are committed to your kids, to your students, and, uh, and we want to, to continue to minister to them. Our volunteers, Stephen, Pastor Stephen, is still in the game, and we're going to keep uh, ministering to them and, and not let you know, anything fall off. And so know that that's our hearts, and at the same time, we're looking. We're going, to try to, we're going to try to fill that position. We're not rushing to just find any available guy. We're asking for God's man uh, to be, to come. And so you, you pray for us uh, with that and, and, and maybe, maybe uh, you know, just asking God, Lord, bring us the person that's going to help take our, uh, our junior high ministry and our youth ministry uh, to the next level. So that's what's going on. I want you to know that and, uh, and please come and be ready. Uh, to pray with and for them uh, and send them off with God's blessing uh, next week. One other thing I want to talk about. Uh, the, the last few weeks, uh, especially if you're a veteran, you've noticed that we've kind of done something different. We've started seating you, okay? And, and that's different. We've never done this before. And I want to just, I want to kind of explain. I think some of you think, you know, we're behind the scenes trying to figure out how we can drive you mad. Uh, that's not what we're doing. Um, I want to I wanna help you understand why. Why we're doing this, okay? Uh, so, that, so at least you have a frame of reference, whether you agree or disagree with this. Uh, that, that's okay with me, but I just want you 
to know our heart and, and behind this. First of all, I want to just say, uh, overarching this, we're, we're trying this, okay? We haven't said we're going to do this till Jesus comes. We've said we're going to see how this works out for now. And there's reasons for it, okay? And I want you to understand these reasons um, and, uh, so, so that you can, you can hear our hearts. First of all, we want to be good stewards. We see this as a stewardship issue, okay? Now, it may not seem like it. Like you look in the back and there's still a row and there's a row back there, two rows back there. It doesn't say, well, why do you guys need this? Everybody should be able to sit where they want to sit. Um, but that's because we're still in the summer. And by the way, welcome back a lot of the college students. I know you're back, but there's a whole lot more to come, okay? And we're going to hit the fall and there's a very good chance we're going to run out of room. Okay, now, when that happens, I see we have three choices. One is we just stop growing, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, as your pastor, that's not happening, okay? We're never going to say, we're done, okay? Everybody go somewhere else, okay? There's other, you know, we, we, we got our, our little club here and we're good. No, we want to see, there's, there's always people to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're never, ever going to get out, give up on that goal, okay? So we're going to be aggressive. We're going to go after people. We want to see people come to know Jesus Christ. That's our goal, okay? So we're not going to stop growing. That really isn't an option. Option two is let's spend a million dollars, right? Let's expand. Let's make the sanctuary bigger, right? And, and, uh, and, and, and try, to, try to make it, well, uh, move somewhere. Anything we do as we put the numbers together is going to cost about half a million to a million dollars, okay? Now, that means a big capital campaign. And that means me standing up and saying, we need your money, right? Come on, you got to give, okay? Now, we can do that. We can, and someday that may happen. Um, but the third option is let's do it for free, <laughs> Right? Let's spend zero dollars and maximize and use every seat we have. Okay? So it's stewardship is, is, is part of what's motiv motivating this. Number two is just simply it's a, it's a capacity thing. Okay, I don't know if you know this. I know that the sign outside says this sanctuary will seat 300 people. Okay, believe me, it doesn't unless you want to sit up here with me. Okay? Uh, max, we've tried every configuration we know, max this place will seat 260 people. This is why we have three services. Okay, 260 people, and, and uh, that means if we're going to get everyone in here, we need to take up every seat. Well, that can be done, Chris. You can just let people sit where they want to sit, and, uh, and then, you know, kind of move them all together. Uh, we've tried that, and some of you know, right? Hey, everybody move together. Okay, right? <laughs> That's what you call moving together. I still got a space. I need my space. Don't want to move, right? No, we're going to have to move you together and make this happen, okay? And so, so that's what we're doing. We're trying to just maximize. Look, God's given us this resource called this, you know, Foothill Church building. It's not great. It's old. The air conditioner doesn't work great on days like this. That's why the windows are shut, okay? I mean, we've got to maximize the resources God's given us. Um, but third... We want to make it easy for people who come late. Now, let me just say something. You know, 10% of you are here on time. I know this, right? Everybody, let's stand and worship. Four people stand up, right? Okay, well, uh, okay, but, you know, most of you come in, and I just want you to imagine, and this is, this is the thing that gets me, I'll be honest with you. I want you to imagine you're a dad who decides, um, I'm getting my family and we're going to church. And he doesn't know Jesus perhaps, but he, you know, he feels a stir and somebody's invited him and he comes. And so he gets here. He knows he's supposed to be here at 1045. So he gets here at 1045. He doesn't realize, he and his wife, that, you know, with their three kids, they got to go check them in in these different places. They don't know where they're way around. It's a little bit disoriented. There's all these people. There's coffee. That Where's the bathroom? All this stuff. He's trying to figure out by the time he gets into the sanctuary, it's 11 o'clock, it's 1110, something like that. All the seats are up. Because we didn't seat anybody, everybody's taking up the back seats. And guess which seats are available? Right down front. Come sit with me. And so he's got to awkwardly and quietly come down to the front, sit down, because there were some people that said, no, that's my seat in the back, and you're not having it. <laughs> and I doubt that guy's coming back. I just put yourself in that situation. You see, I mean, everybody's watching. Everybody's looking. I don't want that, man. I, 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 want, I want it to make it where a guy like that can come in and he doesn't know anybody and maybe he does sit on the back row for the first time. But, but, but he gets to hear the gospel and maybe the Lord will use that to change his life. But let me, let me say one more thing and now I'm gonna talk to you who are Christians, okay? 
you're Christians. What does that mean? Fundamentally, what does it mean? Is it just something we confess or is it something we do? Because fundamentally, here's what it means. It means we believe this crazy thing that there was a God of the universe who made us all, decided that he was going to redeem us all, so he left heaven and perfection, came down, walked among us, sacrificed everything, right, goes, hangs on a cross, he, he, he dies for our sins in, so that we, by believing in him, we could come and go to the place that he's prepared for us called heaven. That's Christianity, and so, some of you aren't even willing to be inconvenienced by being said, can you sit here? And Jesus left heaven. Now you say, well, Chris, that's not fair. Don't pull the gospel card on me. <laughs> well, listen, if I can't pull the gospel card on you, who are we? <laughs> who are we? Do we just say things? Or do we do that? I mean, this is so small, right? It's so minute and little. And like I said, look, we're trying this. But if we're going to put over our doorway, love God, love each other, love our world, uh-uh. No, no, it's fine as long as that's all we say. I don't actually want to do it. Well, then I say this, not to be unkind, but this probably is not the church for you. If it's that big a deal, you probably need to find somebody else, someplace else to worship. Because we want to reach people. And we want to be Christian, not just say we're Christian. Okay? And so we're trying this. We're going to see how this works. We may change it next week. I don't know. But for now, we know the storm is coming. And we're trying to get ready for it as we gear up for the fall. Okay? Can you help me with that? Can we agree that, look, at this is, this is worth doing even if it's an inconvenience to me? Okay, I know it is. We're not doing it to be fiends. We're doing it so that we can reach people for Jesus. That's, that's the heart of everything we do, okay? All right, enough of that. We didn't come talk about seating. Came to talk about a real marriage. So let's, uh, let's talk about uh, what I feel like is a very, very important issue that we, we need to address because it's, it's pandemic, and that's the issue of pornography. I remember the first time I was exposed to pornography. I was, um, I guess I was about 10 years old. I was over at a friend's house, and he, he goes into his room, and he pulls out, I think we go into his room, and he pulls out this magazine. He's like, check this out, and I look at it, and I've, I open it up, and whoa, and I'd never seen anything like that, right? I'm 10 years old. Girls have cooties, and what is happening? Um, and I remember, I remember just feeling this wild range of emotions, like you're tantalized, you're interested, you're intrigued, you're repulsed, you're, you know, you're confused. What, what, what is this? I don't, even, I don't even know what's going on, right? Well, that was the first, and it wouldn't be the last. Uh, I soon realized that many of my friends had stash, right, a stash of porn that they were keeping in their houses that their dads thought they were being clever and had thrown away, but the boy was more clever and he had, he had you know, picked him up, stuck him away somewhere where mom and dad wouldn't find him. And so I, I remember going to one friend of mine uh, and his dad, I think he subscribed to Penthouse or Playboy or one of them, and you could always tell it was porn because it would come in the mail and it would be completely covered up, Right? This is, what, this is what sin does. It's got to be, got to be done in the dark. Um, unfortunately, several years later, both of those families experienced divorce. There was a cousin who, who kept his stash. I went over to his house, and my brother and I, and, and he was like, oh, check this out. And he goes back into his closet, and there's this little secret door in his closet. I'm like, oh, cool, a playroom, you know, a secret room. And unbeknownst to us, there was a reason for this secret room. And he pulls out from under the rafters a whole stash of pornography that he had actually, his dad didn't do it, he had actually run around to garbage bins on garbage day and pulled pornography out of the trash, which is where it belongs, right? And he pulled it up. And looked at it. And so he's sort of passing this out to my brother and I. And we're looking at it. I remember going to the barber shop when I was a kid. And I'm, I think, what, what in the world? What kind of barber would do this? And there's pornography just spread out over his table. You know, and we just kind of p- 
pick it up and, and I think my dad finally found out, like, okay, wrong barber, we're going to somebody else. <laughs> when I was in junior high, <laughs> two high school friends from church thought it would be funny to take me to a triple X drive-in theater and watch a movie. And we couldn't get in, of course, right? I'm, I'm in junior high, they're in high school. So it's out in the country, and we just pulled up next to a dirt service road, and there, I didn't need the sound. I'd never seen anything like this. I was shocked. I was blown away. I, I remember, I remember it was so graphic. Those images are still there. And I knew it was wrong, and I kept putting my head down, and the truth of the matter is, I couldn't look away. I should be addicted to porn. And by the grace of God, I'm not. And I'll explain that. But porn is a problem and it's everywhere. And the truth is, I don't, I don't know what I'd be like if I grew up in the internet age. Um, it's a problem and it's a problem for everyone. But, but maybe let's start off with a definition because pornography may not be what you think it is, right? We all, you know, porn, triple X movies, penthouse and hustler and whatever well let, let me let me suggest a definition for you when it comes to porn because we have become so desensitized to this okay here it is pornography is anything anything that is intended or used to engender sexual lust towards someone who isn't your spouse anything Okay, so what this means is that definition is going to include some television shows. It's going to include movies and pictures and catalogs and books and websites and video games and even mental fantasies that you indulge yourself in in order to engender lust in your heart. So that's going to include magazines on the racks at the grocery store. I don't know why Cosmo isn't in the porn section. Because I take my kids through the grocery line and every time it's like 25 new sex positions that are going to blow his mind. That would include the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Guys, don't tell me. <laughs> and don't try to tell your wife. You know, you skip past that and you, you, know, you get to John Elway or something. I mean, what, it, that's, it's meant to engender lust. That includes the, uh, the winged creatures of Victoria's Secret commercials, right? And the catalogs that you bring into your homes, right? You bring these things. And ladies, let me just tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. He's not thinking about you when you leave that, you know, lying around. Every generation before us would look at a Victoria's Secret catalog today and go, whoa, what is this? We become so, it's not a big deal. Right? This is for my wife. Bull crap. You're not thinking of your wife when you look at that, and guys, you can't look me in the face and say that's true. So, so, so just because the culture doesn't define something as porn, look, at the Supreme Court can't even define what porn is. Antonin Scalia, one of the justices, just say, I just know it when I see it. <laughs> so so, so that's, that's a definition. That definition wouldn't include fantasizing about your spouse you know if you will thinking lustfully about your that's a lust I, mean, I would argue those things are fair game for a married couple not, not, not looking at porn together thinking of each other so, so, so there's a problem that's our definition and, and that means it covers all kinds of things that most of us aren't used to thinking about but let's talk about the porn problem that we have, okay? In case you live under a rock, we have a problem, right? And, and it is absolutely epidemic. Okay, listen to these statistics, okay? Like I could have this half of the room, you don't have to do this, this half of the room and most of this part of the room stand up and that would be roughly the percentage. 70% of men from 18 to 34 visit a pornographic website in a typical month. One study found that 50% of Christian men were addicted to porn. 34% of Christian women admitted to intentionally accessing internet porn, and apparently about one half of those struggle with a porn addiction. The most popular day for viewing porn is, guess what? 
Sunday. Isn't that ironic? 33% of pastors, one in three of me, admit to having visited a sexually explicit website. Of those who had, 53% had visited such sites a few times in the past year. 18% visit sexually explicit sites between a couple of times a month and more than once a week. In 2006, porn revenues were $13 billion just in the United States. That is more than the combined revenue of the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball together. That's more than NBC, ABC, and CBS together. This is the porn industry. Every day, 2.5 million pornographic emails are sent. But who cares, right? I mean, come on, Chris. You're being a prude. What is wrong with looking at a few nude pictures What's wrong with watching a couple have sex? Really? Right? If there was a couple on the couch next to you having sex, would you pull up a chair? <laughs> if you saw a woman on the beach and she walked up next to you and said, I'm going to take my top off and sit next to you, would you just stare at me? Okay, suddenly what's acceptable becomes creepy and voyeuristic. But 38% of people think there's no problem with porn. I mean, come on, who does, porn doesn't hurt anybody. Well, it does. And let, 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 me, let, me, let me demonstrate that to you. Because first and foremost, porn hurts God. You understand, God created us in his image. Right, we are God's creatures and he created, and the Bible says he's our father, dads. Let that sink in for a moment. God is a dad, our Father who art in heaven. You made us. You, you created us. I'm a dad to three girls. And I cannot imagine if my three girls were treated the way that girls in the porn industry are treated. Not just by the industry, but by the gawkers who are staring at their nude bodies for no other reason than sexual lustful satisfaction. Women in the porn industry are raped they're pushed to the limit sexually. They're impregnated. They have multiple abortions. Imagine, dad, if that was your daughter, you would be devastated. And I think that is a mere echo, distant, faint echo of the heart of God. He made us. <laughs> he made us to worship him and enjoy him. He created us with dignity and value and purpose and pardon the pun but all of that is stripped away in porn and I think it devastates the heart of God those are his daughters they were made in his image and you use them and they're being used to just satisfy some lustful craving in your heart it hurts God. But I think, do I need to say this? Porn hurts women. <laughs> I mean, this is actually a question that was asked by, by, asked by, by a, a Princeton University. Princeton, right? Symposium. They all had to get together, these brainiacs of the world, and decide, hey, is porn bad for women? And so they got together and Dr. Jill Manning, she writes this. She does this study of porn and here's what she says. Some of the most significant impact of porn on women and society include A, increased risk of marital distress, separation and divorce. B, increased risk of contracting a sexually transmitted disease from their husband. C, increased isolation and D, increased risk of abuse. And she concludes, I mean, she writes this whole paper and she concludes it this way. Several years ago, I would have considered myself complacent, if not downright indifferent, about the issue of pornography. pornography. Today, I feel an urgency about this issue that often surprises me. As a North American woman and a new mother, I have a deep, foreboding sense of concern over the impact pornography is having on men, women, and children. It hurts women. It degrades them. It takes God's daughter and says, I want to use you to satisfy me. 
But you know what? Porn hurts you. If you decide you're going to look at porn, it hurts you. And here's what I mean. It will warp your mind. That's not just, you know, pastoral hyperbole where I'm trying to be dramatic. I want you to listen. First of all, I want you to understand the Bible teaches very clear that lust is wrong. Lust is sinful. Lust is unholy. Lust is unhelpful. Lust is, in fact, hurtful. It's hurtful to the person you're looking at. Maybe they know it, don't know it, and it's hurtful to you and your soul. And most non-Christians, and maybe even some Christians, would scoff at that notion. Oh, come on. You can't look at a woman, undress her with your eyes, do whatever. And yet modern medicine always seems to catch up with the Bible, you know, what the Bible said for millennia. It always seems to sort of come around and go, oh, 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 yeah. They don't want to say it's what the Bible says. But porn has side effects. Serious, serious side effects. Modern medicine is now telling us that pornography, like a drug, actually alters the chemistry of the brain. It changes you. A guy by the name of William Struthers, he's written a book called Wired for Intimacy. Okay? He's a Christian biopsychologist. He studies the effects of pornography on uh, the brain. Listen to what he writes. As we fall deeper into the mental habit of fixating on these images, the exposure to them creates neural pathways. Like a path is created in the woods with each successive hiker, so do the neural pathways set the course for the next time an erotic image is viewed. Over time, these neural paths become wider and they are repeatedly traveled with each exposure to pornography. They become the automatic pathway through which interactions with women are routed. They have unknowingly created a neurological circuit that imprisons their ability to see women and men rightly as created in God's image. Now, let me elaborate. Let me just kind of explain. So you and I are wired with this desire for sexual intimacy. That is not a bad desire, okay? Dads, as you deal with your boys, okay, it's okay. They should. That's a healthy thing. It's what they do with that healthy thing. Okay, so to satisfy that desire, here's what some of you guys do. You head down the porn path, right? You go, and listen, the first time you do it, it's like hiking in the woods, right? And you, you go, this is sort of adventurous, and I've never done this before, and this, wow, it's kind of a new experience. And over time, you do it more and more, and it becomes, you return, and it becomes the way you scale the mountain of sexual pleasure. And it becomes wider so that you don't just naturally go up. There's no other way over the mountain. You have to go through porn. And you'd say, well, Chris, that's exactly what I would expect a Christian biopsychologist, whatever that means, to say. All right. Let's not believe him for a minute. Let's believe, you know, the amazing scientist John Mayer Her body is a wonderland, man. And I want to just make a disclaimer here. I did not look at Playboy. I didn't look at any porn this week. Uh, I read some things, but I want you to hear an interview with Playboy. This is John Mayer. They ask him about pornography. He says, pornography? It's the new synaptic pathway. Internet pornography has absolutely changed my generation's expectations. How does porn not affect the psychology of having a relationship with someone? It's got to, end quote. He goes on in this article to say he would prefer, he now prefers getting alone in his own mind and reimagining sexual exploits and, and, and thinking again and watching porn to actually having a physical relationship with a woman. He says, oh, there's probably been dozens and dozens of mornings where I've woken up and before I've gotten out of bed, I've seen 300 vaginas. Davy Rothbert, a, uh, a writer for the New York Times, not a Christian, he writes this article and he starts off by describing a sexual encounter that he had with a woman and how he had, re how he had been looking at porn. And he says this, quote, 
porn is not only shaping men's physical and emotional interest in sex on a very fundamental neurological level, but it's also having a series of unexpected ripple effects, namely on women. For a lot of guys, switching gears from porn's fireworks to the comparatively mundane of ordinary sex is like leaving halfway through an IMAX 3D movie to check out a flip book. And then he goes on to say, so I interviewed all these people. I interviewed all these young men and women and asked them, how does porn affect your sex lives? And here's, here's Stefan. Stefan's a 43-year-old married man who talks about having sex with his wife. He says this, in order to fully enjoy sex with his wife, quote, I've got to resort to playing scenes in my head that I've seen while viewing porn. Something is lost there. I'm no longer with my wife. I'm inside my own head. That's perverse. He interviews another man who talks about how he, there was a day when he couldn't wait to get home and he'd rush home to make love to his wife. Now, he doesn't do that. He rushes home to get home before his wife so he can look at porn. Another single guy who talks about, you know, he, you know, sex with a lot of women, but my favorite thing is that each night of the week, I have a different date with a different porn star that I sit and watch. And I love Wednesdays or Thursdays, whatever it is, because that's when so-and-so comes on, and wow, she really does me. Andrea Kazuski, a behavioral therapist, says, the chemical effect of porn is such that when you watch it, quote, you're bonding with it. And those chemicals make you want to keep coming back to have that feeling. It's a drug. That's why people talk about being addicted to porn. Now, why do we do this? What is at the heart of pornography that drives us? Let me tell you biblically what the Bible says is going on that causes this to happen in you and in me. The first thing I want you to see is it's just, it's just lust, right? Right? The porn industry is built on lust. That's what the whole thing is about, right? It's designed to make you lust, to, to bring up those feelings. And listen, porn, Playboy, Penthouse, Maxim, whatever, they don't put that in you. It's there, and they just exploit it. That's why Paul's going to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, that sexual perverts were given up to the lust of their hearts. It's already there. It's in their heart. They just give up to it. And they give up to it, and so God gives them over to it, Paul says. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 20, 28, that a man who looks lustfully upon a woman, that's porn, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Porn is a heart issue always has been, always will be. There's something going on in your heart. But how about this? In addition to lust, there's covetousness. Now, these are close relatives, right? Lust and covetousness. But here's what I mean. Covetousness is this feeling of, I'm not content with what I have. I need more. I'm not satisfied with what, what I've been given. See, porn, porn feeds on this. It looks at you and goes, look, buddy, one woman isn't enough. Your wife isn't enough. You can do better. You can have more. Don't be satisfied with what you've got. Right? There's so much, right, for the picking out there. You shouldn't be just with one woman. And yet, uh, it's interesting that the 10th commandment says that we're not supposed to covet our neighbor's house or his wife. <laughs> Right? I'm supposed to covet my own wife. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 says, tells men to rejoice in the wife of your youth. Presumably talking to older men who tend to have wandering eyes. Hey, don't re rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be intoxicated with her love. You know, one of the ways porn will destroy your marriage if there's all these options out there and it will totally wreck the standard of beauty that God meant you to live by. Here's what I mean. See, God comes and he creates, you know, he creates Adam. Remember, we've talked about this practically every week and he parades all these animals in front of Adam and I'm going to give you a wife. God didn't sit down with Adam and go, hey, let's talk about this wife thing, okay? What do you like, Adam? You like blondes? Okay, tall, short, okay? Do they, you know, tattoos, piercings? What, do, do you like... 
Do you like, uh, you know, Caucasian, black, uh, Asian? What, what do you want, Adam? I want to I wanna give you what you want. No, as the Bible says, Adam, go to bed, okay? I'm going to make a wife. God makes her, brings her to Adam. Adam goes, thank God, it's not an armadillo, it's a woman, right? <laughs> and, he's, and he says, and, and, and Adam, this is your standard of beauty. Here she is. Okay, now, porn comes along and goes, no, no, no. No, I know. There might have been a day when she was hot, but look, don't be satisfied with your wife. You can have more. And what happens is that you can't be satisfied any longer with what God's given you. See, let me, let me put it to you this way. <laughs> Guys, if, if your wife is tall, you're into tall. If she's short, you're into short. If she's skinny when you get married, you're into skinny. And if she gains some weight, you're suddenly into chunky. Okay? If she's pregnant, you love pregnant. Okay? She's got brunette long hair when you're married. You love brunettes. And if she cuts it, spikes it, and bleaches it, suddenly you like spiky, bleached-headed, short-haired woman. Okay? If she's 22, you love 22. But if she's 70, you adore 70. You hear what I'm saying? She's your standard. She's your standard. And you need to let her know that. I desire you. I love you. You're the one God gave to me. See, here's the thing. What well, God says, I, bring, I brought you this woman. I'm going to bring you a woman. And, you know, this, I think some of these single guys, you're like, I got to check off my list. Is she Asian? You know, is she five foot four? Does she have a hot body? Does she have, you know, whatever. And Christianity's down here. God brings you a woman and you find, man, this is a great combination, but you know, she doesn't fit all my menu of things. And listen, what you do is you take that woman that God gives you, you get rid of the fantasy on the page, which is what it is. Those, those, those films are fantasies, okay? Hear me, that's not real. The woman on that film is not enjoying it the way that she looks like she is. And you get rid of that and you let your wife define beauty and you provide for her and you, you love her and you serve her and you protect her and you have sex with her and you enjoy her and suddenly, you know, you find she's my definition of beauty. The happier, more satisfied you will be. I think Mark and Drace Griscoll are, are right in this book. They say porn exists to give you a menu of options, none of which are your spouse. <laughs> so there's lust, there's covetousness, but there's also idolatry. Okay, the first two commandments. Okay, the Ten Commandments. What's the first one? I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the, you know, the, out of the land of Egypt. He's saying, I'm God, there's no other. And the second one is basically, don't worship anything or anyone but me. Okay, and this is a problem for us because we are hopeless, helpless worshipers, right? This is why people go to concerts and do their lighters and, you know, they stand on their feet and rock back and forth. And this is why we go to the can Grand Canyon and we can't stop looking at it because there's something inside of you that says you were made to worship. It's, it's atheist worship. It doesn't matter who you are. The question isn't whether you worship, it's who, what you worship, and so last week we talked about Romans 1 and you can look at it, the birth of a worshiper and you either worship God and you enjoy his creation or you worship creation. There's only two choices. And every person in this room struggles, even if you're a Christian, between the worship of God and the worship of his creation. And whatever, hear me, whatever you worship will get your time, it'll get your money, it'll get your thought life, it will comfort you when you're depressed, it will make you even feel better when things are great. And that's porn for some of you. It gets your time, it gets your money, it gets your thought life, had a bad day at work, I deserve this, had a great day at work, ah, oh, it'd be great to unwind with that. That's your God, that's idolatry. That's what's in your heart. And God's showing you that. Every time you look at porn, pay for an adult movie, fantasize about another woman, you're worshiping. And if your worship terminates on anything less than God, it's called idolatry. So that's what's there. Now, 
I, I know this is not a lot of good news I've given you, right? And this is hard. And that's been intentionally so. I want, I want you to know this. I, I, I want to shake us out of this feeling. We, we are a porn-saturated culture. You know, you know, sadly, something like 90% of porn movies are filmed in Los Angeles County. I mean, it's everywhere. And, and we, we've become so numb to this that you need hard words. Hard words make soft hearts. Soft words make hard hearts. You need hard, edgy words at some times to wake us up, splash cold water in our face, and say, wait a second. We play around with it all the time like it's no big deal. I was just reading something uh, today. A, 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 a guy was telling a story where he said, you know, we've become so desensitized. And he said, he said, I remember when I was in seminary, we're sitting there watching Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Remember with Sean Connery. Remember the scene? Remember the scene where they're standing there and they realize that both father and son have had sex with the same Nazi woman? And he said, I remember watching that. And here we are in seminary. And everybody's like, ho, 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 that's funny. And a guy, and the older guy in the back of the room goes, guys, it's fornication and incest. That's not funny. We do this all the time. We make it like it's no big deal. So, so you need the cold water. I need the cold water. But listen, I don't want to just leave us there in the dumps. <laughs> What's the solution? What's the solution to this whole problem? Well, the porn solution isn't something, it's someone, it's Jesus. See, maybe you've totally jacked up, right? You, you, you think, man, it's too late. The ruts are deep. I've gone too far, I, right? I, 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 you know, I, I've got this issue. And, and, and hear me, with Jesus, it's never too late. The same power, the Bible says, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you if you're a Christian, so, so I want you to turn, if you've got, you're using the Bibles in your chair next, next to you, I want you to turn to, to Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 16 through 24. I'm just going to read it quickly. Don't have time to unpack it all. But I just want to say a couple things. Okay, listen to what Paul says, page 975 of the, of the Bibles in your chair. But I say, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of those. What, what's the key? How do, you, how do you get out of porn? You walk by the Spirit. You don't just stop doing something, you start doing this. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. You've got a war going on. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you're a Christian, here's something I know about you. You want to do the right thing. You want to be holy. You don't want to look at porn. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. By the way, every time in the, in the New Testament there's a list of sins, every single time sexual immorality is in there. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a big warning. What this means is you habitually, unrepentantly go look at porn. God says, if that's you, you're not, you're not going to be in the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. And against these things, there is no law. Nobody ever, ever enacted a law that says you can't be good. Said you don't, no, we don't want to have self-control around here, Right? And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So let me just say a couple of things in closing. Okay? You want out of porn. Okay, let me talk to you first of all. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Because the truth of the matter is, I have, I have nothing to offer you outside of Jesus. No counseling, no 12-step program. You need Jesus. Okay, a Christian is what? 
A Christian is not just somebody who decided one day, woke up and said, I'm going to stop. No, no, no. Never. <laughs> Never. You know what? You know how we get rid of sin in our lives, Christian and non-Christian? You know how that happens for everyone? Is you exchange one desire for another desire. Something bigger supplants it. So the goal of Christianity is not to stop sinning. The goal of Christianity is to start worshiping. Because you're worshiping the wrong thing. And so what happens is I start worshiping Jesus. I, and, and over time, as I, as I pour myself more into my passion for Jesus and look to him and, and he saves me, then he transfers my affections from that thing, that other person, to himself. And the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. And the goal of Christianity is not to stop getting you to, to get you to stop looking at porn, but to start worshiping Jesus. It's not, hey, you know, try harder to stop. It's, no, love Jesus more. Be more passionate about this thing that'll really bring you joy. Spend time with him, right? Be with his people, in his word, talk to him in prayer. Okay, but second, if you already are a Christian, or even if you are becoming a Christian, listen, be honest and quit making excuses for yourself. Paul's going to say in Ephesians 5, right? You're now children of the light. Don't walk in darkness. Expose the darkness. Let Jesus shine a light. And what that means is you maybe need to go home and confess your sin before God. You may need to go home and you should go home and confess your sin to your wife, to your husband. The devastator. Well, yeah, but you got this secret sin that needs light exposed on it. And God, he will set you free. See, see, you go, God, here's my sexual sin. He already knows it, but the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the promise of Scripture. Don't excuse yourself. Call sin, sin. Not like, oh, yeah, it's just kind of a little dalliance I have on the side. No, it's sin. Third, John Piper said, listen to this, be killing sin or it will be killing you. You have got to be aggressive. This is a take no prisoners mentality. You don't play around. You don't dance around it. You don't get as close as you can. You kill it. You run from sexual sin. You don't try to see how close you can get to the edge. You run, right? A guy told me last night, I took my laptop a few years ago and I threw it into a full bathtub. And he said, and I didn't have internet or a computer in my home for over two years. And I was like, high five, dude. That's awesome. You want to kill it. Or it'll kill you. It'll kill you. It'll kill your marriage. It'll kill your sex life. It'll kill you. And then fourth, feed your new desires. Feed the, look it. When a person becomes a Christian, God gives us new desires. I want to please God. I want to be holy. I want to be obedient. It doesn't mean, as Paul just said, the old desires are gone. Now they're waging war, right? Somebody wrote a poem that said, now that I'm a Christian, two natures beat within my chest. The one is cursed. The one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. What are you feeding? What are you, are you feeding your spirit or are you feeding your flesh? What does that look like, Chris? What am I supposed to do? You can feed your spirit. Listen, the way you feed your spirit is you, you read this Bible that he's given you. You walk in Christian community with people, spirit-filled people. You're faithful to a church that preaches you the word and exhorts you through scripture. You pray and you seek God. Listen, you're like, that sounds so basic. It is. And so many people don't do this. It's the weapon that God has given you and you don't do it. The more you feed your spirit, the stronger it's going to become. The more you feed your flesh, the stronger it's going to become. Which are you going to do? And how aggressive will you be in addressing it? Look at, you want to settle for porn, then you're settling for lesser things. God wants to give you new desires, new pathways, right? I mean, just a newness of life. That's the promise of Scripture. So I have not done this perfectly. I told you some of my struggles early on. 
But I can tell you, I should be one in three pastors. But by God's grace, I am not. That sin doesn't have a grip on me and it's not because I'm not human, I'm not a man who has lustful desires in his heart, it's, it's not because I don't feel temptation, it's not because when I see that billboard, nothing goes off in my heart, it's because every time that temptation comes, I want to yield to the prompting of the Holy Spirit that says, Chris, here's your chance. Love Jesus. Worship Jesus. You, you love him more than you love that thing. I've been faithful to Michelle. I don't say this to brag to you. I say this with God as my witness. I have been faithful to Michelle 23 years, of our, all 23 years of our marriage. I've never cheated on her. I've never had adultery with another woman. I've never even had mental adultery or heart adultery through pornography. And I'm telling you, that's the power of God. That's what Christ can do in you. You feed your spirit daily, hourly, whatever it takes. How long do I have to do it? Your entire life. Because your sanctification is grindingly, haltingly, sometimes discouragingly slow. But I want you to think of your child crawling under your garage door. And the garage door starts to come down on their little head. And there's a baby that can't defend them. Guys, how long, how hard would you pull against that garage door? You would break your back for that child. That thing would have to crush you before it crushed them. That's how you deal with sin. It's not a joke. And it will kill you. And it will kill people around you. And you strive against it. And what you realize is as you're doing that, you're feeding your spirit. You're running from sin. You're running to Jesus and he'll help you. Let's pray.